Association. And it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you here today on the start of our eBay's series of events, which we are going to call Barconomic Talks. Uh, these talks will be dedicated to current Ukraine's economic and military situation uh, that is happening due the, uh, to the war that is happening with Russia today in Ukraine. Uh, we are During the talks, we are going to talk to the experts around the world to hear their opinions and forecasts on how to rebuild Ukraine's economy, as well as their thoughts on how the war of U in Ukraine affects the geopolitical situation in the whole world, international security architecture, and also uh, how it influences business opportunities. We do want to engage all of you to take active part in the webinar, so you are uh, very much welcome to write your questions during the presentations and after the presentations we are going to try to answer these questions. And before I give the floor to our today's experts, I would like to first of all thank the Embassy of Switzerland to Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova for supporting this event and also to invite Alvaro Borghi, Deputy Head of Mission at the Embassy, to say a couple of welcoming words. So, Alvaro. Thank you very much, Julia. It's a great pleasure to, to talk to you. Um, first of all, I, I must apologize that Ambassador Claude Ville uh, uh, didn't make it, but there is a very good reason, and I hope you will understand it. Uh, yesterday, our government decided to reopen our embassy in Kiev, and uh, today he's on his way in this very moment. I guess he just crossed or will be crossing a few minutes the Ukrainian border. And tomorrow, officially, our embassy, after two months and a half, will be open again. So we are very happy about this. Uh, um, there is some collateral damage. It's just uh, that you have to, to uh, be today with me. But uh, I think that the, the, there is a, a good explanation. And I hope now that we will open that he will be there that we can join him and that we can hopefully have the next uh, work economic talks uh, uh, in physical presence or in hybrid format, or at least that's what I wish personally, because I think it's always better to, to see each other. But let's do what we can. I want to thank you, Julia, to EA for our very uh, long-standing cooperation. Um, I'm quite new at the embassy still. Uh, but I know you have a, a very long cooperation, very fruitful cooperation uh, going on, especially with Olena. Um, it's an example, I think, to, to see how Ukraine continue to work. Uh, we are impressed by how the Ukrainian government, the companies, uh, everybody continue working in spite of the war. And I think it's also an example of how our, how our embassy continue to work with Ukraine. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. And I think we have a very... A peculiar situation if we consider the economic uh, situation. It's very peculiar because we are uh, talking about uh, recovery, uh, whereas the war is still going on. Normally, you, you, you wait for the war to, to be over to start to speak about recovery. Here, we are already talking about this. And I wish to insist on the fact that Switzerland stands very close to Ukraine as far as recovery is concerned. In July, in, in about 50 days, uh, we will have here, actually I'm here in Lugano, uh, by coincidence, it's my town, and here in Lugano, we will have uh, the U Ukraine Recovery Conference. It used to be called Ukraine Reform Conference, now it's the Ukraine Recovery Conference, which we could co-organize with the uh, Ukrainian government uh, in, in July. So uh, I hope we can contribute a lot to the beginning of the, the reconstruction. Um, we have now uh, two uh, guest speakers. I want to um, thank them. Uh, they have very uh, strong links to, to Switzerland. Uh, I don't know if I should uh, mention them or if you want to do so. I can do it if you wish. Yes, yes, please go ahead. <laughs> so very quickly, I think you received the invitation, so you know who will be talking today. Uh, but very quickly, uh, we have, um, uh, well, they're not Swiss, but they, they have very, very long-standing relation with Switzerland. Um, a private lecturer, Dr. Marcel Koepp, uh, he's in Switzerland for almost 20 years, and since 2013, he has been working as a lecturer in military economics at the Military Academy of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. And he has received many awards uh, for his achievements in academic research, and he will share his vision on the economic reconstruction of Ukraine. 
And our second uh, guest speaker is uh, Elena Parker. Uh, she was born in Kharkiv, in Kharkiv, but she's been living in Zurich for 12 years. And she's the founder of Impact Ukraine, which is a Swiss nonprofit organization designed to support SMEs in Ukraine with a vision to help rebuild Ukraine. And she will share insights about collaboration opportunities between Swiss and Ukrainian businesses. So I hope we can start to give a, a Swiss contribution to the uh, recovery and reconstruction of, with, of Ukraine. We will start with this. And as soon as you want, we will continue. And we're always open to have new projects. Thank you very much, Julia. I wish to everybody a, a good work economic talks today. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Alvaro. So, Marcos, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Julia. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me and for organizing this conference. Uh, I would like to salute the Deputy Ambassador to uh, Ukraine and Moldova. Thanks very much for joining us today. It's a great honor to, to speak to you. I also salute the members of Ukrainian Parliament who might now be listening to us and, of course, the representatives of both Ukrainian and international uh, business. Um, my idea for today is exactly as the Deputy Ambassador said, that um, while the war is going on, um, we are in the fortunate position of already making plans and exchanging ideas for the future reconstruction of Ukraine. And it is with this uh, goal in mind uh, that I would like to, to contribute, well, let's say some ideas of what I think would be promising opportunities, both for private business and for uh, the civilian reconstruction of uh, Ukraine. I've also provided uh, some background on some of the questions that appeared in the invitation letter. Um, so what I present today is not necessarily uh, everything. So feel free to, to ask me whatever you may have on your mind, and I will try to respond uh, as, as well as I can. So I will now uh, share my screen with you and, and uh, move to my little uh, presentation. So you should now see this, uh, everyone, um, Rebuilding Ukraine. Um, I, will, I chose to, to focus on three, um, I would say, low-hanging fruit or quick win uh, opportunities where, uh, where there is a lot of opportunity and, and also a uh, possibility to organize this in a relatively uh, straightforward way. Um, if you're interested in, in what I am or what I wrote so far, I'm ridiculously uh, easy uh, to, to find on the web. Um, so you can just Google my name or like look at some of the books I wrote, but I'm, I don't want to talk about myself today, but about Ukraine. So um, first thing I would like to, to suggest is um, we have, especially in the West, we have a lot of people who now come out um, with this, uh, let's say, idea of Ukraine needs a Marshall Plan, Ukraine needs help, uh, Ukraine needs foreign money. And um, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, I think Ukrainian business is, is very, very good at innovating, at improvising, at organizing things. Um, and uh, well, I would say in being employed by a government bureaucracy myself, uh, I'm not sure that government bureaucrats can necessarily provide uh, what Ukraine needs. Um, but I'm pretty sure that private business can provide what Ukraine needs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the war is not spreading, um, uh, let's, say, let's say, equally in all uh, regions of Ukraine, but there is a, a region of Ukraine that will be heavily damaged, uh, both in, in terms of civilian infrastructure and in terms of business opportunity. This is what I marked in red. So this is where you would say um, doing business in this zone will probably be difficult, if not impossible, and this is there where foreign aid uh, would be required in terms of, uh, say, um, providing housing, providing food and shelter, electricity, uh, preventing diseases. So this is where you could put uh, government organizations in. But um, in the blue zone, um, where I would say um, that that's the region where private business um, can do a lot more, because in, luckily, and let's hope it stays that way, um, the war has come to these regions, but not to an extent that I would say the infrastructure is so damaged uh, that you could not do business. I believe that whatever damage we have in the blue zone can be relatively, uh, can be reconstructed relatively fast and new business opportunities can be built. So um, when we look at, uh, say, the past of, of what Ukraine um, has, has made money with to date, I would say that this um, energy or gas transit business will continue uh, at least for some years, but I think it's a business model that will gradually uh, phase out. 
Um, so as of today, Ukraine is still channeling oil by the southern um, branch of the Druzhba pipeline, also channeling gas, uh, mostly to the landlocked uh, European countries, um, especially Austria. Um, but uh, when we look at, uh, say, the current political initiatives in Europe uh, that intend to phase out uh, these long-term gas contracts. And I would say um, Ukraine can still make money from this. I would say it's a business model still in the cash cow phase in terms of transit fees, but it will degrade. Um, so I'd say now is the right time to think about how to, to um, build the next generation of, of post-modern or post-Soviet uh, Ukrainian um, economic uh, structures that do no longer rely uh, on let's say uh, doing doing services uh, on behalf of others, but coming up um, with an own uh, productive and, and innovative uh, industry. This is not to say that I'm against uh, oil or gas contracts, but I think that the way geopolitics are going right now, that uh, eventually Turkey uh, will be the new transit country um, that uh, that Russia will use to channel uh, natural gas, uh, in in particular to the uh, new LNG hub that Turkey plans to build in Ceyhan. So um, I would say if maybe until 2030, um, gas will still be routed through Ukraine, but I think it's a degrading business model. Um, so we should think about, well, how to, how to build the next generation um, business for Ukraine. Um, now, many of you have asked me about the um, problem of uh, Ukrainian crops not going out to the world market, and uh, could there be a danger of a, a global famine uh, or whatever? I think it's quite the contrary. Uh, many Western media keep now banging uh, about a so-called global food crisis. And to the best of my knowledge and to the best of the data, I would say there is no uh, global food crisis. Um, the problem is, is something completely different. Um, if Ukrainian crops cannot leave Ukraine as it is the situation right now, then others will come along, expand their supply at Ukraine's cost. Um, so the problem is, is, is not that um, we would have too few crops or too few uh, grain harvests in the world market. The problem is that uh, Ukrainian crops cannot leave Ukraine at this time, at least not by uh, the, let's say, logistics channel um, that, that Ukraine has used to date. Um, so let's, let's have a look at um, Port of Odessa, which is fortunately are not affected by the war. Of course, the city of Odessa has been hit by, by Russian missiles, but not the, the port. And um, this, uh, this new container terminal that you see in, in red here was constructed by the port of Hamburg in, uh, in Germany and um, with a view of facilitating um, Ukrainian exports through the Black Sea and of course uh, into Hamburg. And it, it applies to both, uh, to both grain exports um, and uh, containers. Now, the problem is um, what you see here. Um, the, the, unfortunately, at this time, Russia can interdict all Ukrainian shipping in the Black Sea. And that's not limited to the control of Snake Island. Of course, as long as, as Russia controls Snake Island, there will be no Ukrainian shipping out of the Black Sea. But also when we say sooner or later, um, Ukraine will recapture Snake Island, even then you will still have to deal with a potentially hostile Russia with the Black Sea fleet, probably with submarines that will try to harass Ukrainian shipping. And um, this, this is a serious problem because this used to be Ukraine's primary logistics route. So today Ukraine has looked to the south and to the east um, for much of, of its export infrastructure. And as, as long as this structure is controlled by Russia or can be interdicted by Russia, there will be no Ukrainian trade flows, at least not by that route. And this is because why I say um, we probably have to stop looking to the south and east, and we have to look to the north and the west. So what we have to to do in order to restart Ukrainian trade, in particular, in, in order to get Ukrainian grain to the world market as fast as possible, um, we have to establish uh, a land corridor into Poland. Now, the fortunate thing is we already have it. Um, uh, and uh, I, I'm sure it's, it's now an open secret that American military aid is coming in by that little regional airport of Zeszow in Poland, uh, which used to be a very sleepy uh, place, then few people in the West actually knew that this city existed. 
Um, but the thing is, all the logistics um, that are now being brought in by the Americans will, of course, stay after the war is over. And I expect that this airbase in Jeshov will be the core of a new NATO or United States forward deployment. Um, so in a, in a way, Ramstein in Germany is the role model for that type of development. It was also um, a, a little regional airport um, that was turned into a major uh, American logistics and military hub. And I expect that Jeshov will go exactly the same way. So the good thing is that you will have uh, an enormously well-developed uh, logistics base right behind your border. And that doesn't only apply to air traffic, it also applies to rail and to road uh, traffic. And uh, Lviv in Ukraine is a major, uh, a major railway hub, and there is also a direct connection from Odessa uh, to Lviv, so a direct railway line. So my simple idea is to say, okay, what if we use Poland as uh, your new export corridor, at least while the Black Sea is, is under Russian control? Uh, now, the, the problem is um, in, in Europe, we have these things called mountains and uh, mountains are a problem for railways. Um, so we have the Carpathians, of course, in, in Romania, and we also have the Alps in, in Switzerland and Austria. So direct east-west rail traffic is difficult um, and it's not very, uh, very economic in terms of econ economics of scale. Um, so this is what I, what I um, marked here by the red uh, arrows. But fortunately, um, thanks to the uh, presence in Zheshov, um, we now have um, a much better logistics infrastructure south of Warsaw. Uh, this always was the problem with, um, with uh, say, this corridor in the southeast of Poland. Um, you have a very well uh, developed infrastructure right into Warsaw, but everything south of Warsaw is the problem. Now that would change a lot with, uh, with the American presence and um, with NATO forward deployment. So we would have uh, this blue line that connects Lviv to Zheshov, to Warsaw, to Berlin, and from Berlin to West Germany, from which you have a direct connection both to the North Sea and the Mediterranean uh, Sea. So you don't have to go by Gdansk in Poland and then around Denmark, which leads you nowhere. Um, and also it's, it's quite expensive uh, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of logistics costs, but you would have direct access to the North Sea. Um, just to show you how this would work, um, we, had an, uh, we had a report just two days ago in the German press. So um, this article is saying German Railways is facilitating grain exports from Ukraine. And by now, um, just if these two days is, is basically an improvisation. And um, you see that it's, it's still foreign railway lines and that do this transport for you. Um, but you should envision that um, in, in a few months, you will do this yourself by Ukrainian railways and earning your own money with it instead of paying foreign uh, logistics companies to get uh, your products and your grain out of there. And you see that once this railway corridor would be established, uh, it wouldn't be limited to grain exports. You could export basically everything. Uh, for example, industrial gases like argon, xenon, uh, titan dioxide, coal, um, you name it. And this corridor would be very safe. Uh, it could not be intercepted by Russia. It runs through flat terrain. So you can use long and heavy trains. And in particular, you don't have to crouch along the Black Sea coast and looking for, let's say, desperate uh, substitutes like, for example, Constanta in Romania or Varna in Bulgaria, uh, because these ports are quite small and they don't have uh, the capacity that we would need um, in, in Western Europe. So this, this is very much um, a business of scale. The longer the trains, the heavier they are, the cheaper transport becomes. And uh, you see the, what I marked here at, at the left in red, um, this would be the region in West, uh, in West Germany, Switzerland and uh, the Netherlands where your uh, transport would arrive. It would arrive in the major rail hubs of Mannheim or of Cologne in Germany. And from there you have the Rhine Valley corridor that connects Switzerland to the south, uh, to Geneva, to the, uh, to the Mediterranean and to the north to Rotterdam, um, which is by far the busiest port in Europe, which links um, both Switzerland and everything behind it to the North Sea. So this would be your export corridor um, that is stable um, with a high throughput, high speed um, connection and that cannot be interdicted by Russia. So this would be my first idea. And uh, the, the more you can use that corridor to get the grain that you now have in your warehouses, uh, the, the more you can use it to get your grain out, the better 
uh, your economic situation will become. And I suggest you do this quickly because um, the last thing you want is that the war is going in, in a direction where Russia is able to steal the grain that is now in Ukrainian warehouses and ship it off uh, by the Black Sea, say, to Syria or to whatever uh, other country. So um, it's, it's really important um, that this grain be moved north. And I think this railway corridor is, is a quick win uh, by, by, um, by which um, you could do this. So this is, um, this is not Ukraine. Um, this is uh, a photo from the border between China and Kazakhstan. Um, now, you know, of course, that Ukraine uses the Soviet broad track uh, system in its railway. So it's, it runs on 15, 20 uh, millimeter uh, breadth. And in Europe, we have 14, 35 millimeters. But that is not so much the problem. Um, we have exactly the same situation on the border between China and Kazakhstan. China uses the European normal track and Kazakhstan uses the Soviet broad track. And now what you have there, this is um, near the Chinese city of Alashankou, right at the border, is a railroad terminal um, where trains from China come in from, one, from the one side and the cargo just get, gets lifted over um, by this uh, large yellow crane uh, to the other train um, that's coming in from Kazakhstan and then a uh, train goes off to Kazakhstan. Um, and I suggest that this could be built in Ukraine. Um, so you would do the business yourself. You would uh, organize all the cargo traffic um, because um, it's, it's not so good for Ukrainian economy if this uh, terminal is built in Poland. Um, what you should do is actually handle um, this, um, this difference in, in the tracks and exploit this uh, for your own logistics and then do all the transit business and then um, just send off these traffic uh, into Poland. Another second topic I wanted to talk about is energy. Uh, we have uh, big problems in Europe right now uh, with the stability of our energy grid. And that is uh, related to the transition to renewable energy we have in Europe right now, and also to the uh, gradual phasing out of coal and nuclear power. That puts enormous strain on the European network. And um, this has, this has reached a really critical point where we're now talking about rationing electricity or helping um, European grid operators and electricity producers with state subsidies. So what we would desperately need, in particular in Western and Central Europe, is a stable, basic, reliable supply of continuous energy that can be imported. Now, guess where we read is where it is. And um, when, when we look at Ukraine and compare it to Switzerland, then the two countries are very similar in terms of energy production, in particular electrical energy. Um, they produce uh, most of what they uh, need and also export from nuclear and hydro uh, power. Um, so what you see here in the, uh, in, the, um, in the left corner is a big hydroelectric plant near Kherson. And the flags you see uh, in the upper uh, diagram are the nuclear uh, power plants of Ukraine. And when you look at the diagram to the right, um, you see the unfortunate effect of the war. This is the electricity demand um, in Ukraine, so both from, from private uh, households and uh, business. And you see how demand is collapsing as a result of the war, of course. And um, some of this demand collapse will remain, unfortunately, because we have large uh, consumers like the Azovstal uh, plant, for example, in Mariupol, which is now largely destroyed. So I expect that for the uh, for the next couple of years, Ukraine will be able to produce much more energy, in, in particular electrical energy, um, but it will have little opportunity to use it um, for its own economy, because first we have to rebuild the economy before that electricity can be used again. Um, so Ukraine has an enormous export potential of electrical energy. And that means, of course, an enormous potential to earn money by exporting this excess um, electrical energy to Europe. So you would see how it, how it could work out. Ukraine would earn money by electricity exports and we in, in Europe and the West, we would gladly take it in order to stabilize the European grid. Um, and um, you, you've probably heard about this revolutionary act. This has never um, happened before in world history that a whole country has changed uh, its electricity system basically overnight and Ukraine separated uh, itself from the Russian uh, synchronous grid and joined NSOE, the European synchronous grid. This has never happened before. And um, it's, it's really surprising. Uh, it, it works. It's never before has such a large economy, such a large electrical grid be 
integrated into an existing synchronous grid, but it works surprisingly well for the time being with that reduced capacity we have. So what we need is investment in energy infrastructure. And uh, one of the ways how this could work is so-called high voltage direct current. Um, the synchronous grid I've just shown you is alternating uh, current and alternating current needs a lot of, um, of complex infrastructure, um, but direct current is a lot easier uh, to build. In the, uh, the lower left uh, corner, you see uh, overland cables that, uh, that can export or import large quantities of electrical energy. Um, you see, it looks, it looks a bit like a pipeline. And um, when I just uh, switch back some slides, um, when you look at, at the European grid, these purple lines you see in the North uh, Sea, for example, between Holland and Norway or between uh, Sweden and Lithuania, you see that most of these um, cables are underwater cables. So they can stretch for like 600 miles underwater, absolutely no problem, um, very little loss. Um, so these are already used uh, below the seabed to, uh, to transport large quantities of energy. Um, so once we would do the same uh, in Ukraine, say we would build such an overland transport just uh, from right behind the border into Poland, um, then this would enable uh, Ukraine to export large amounts of energy. Germany is doing the same, or is at least is planning to do the same, let's put it this way, um, to export large quantities of uh, renewable energy from the North Sea coast to central and southern Germany. So you see the, the, the idea is there, it's technically feasible, uh, it just requires some investment, but it could be built much faster uh, than alternating current um, architectures. And the final thing um, I would like to, to stress is uh, in the West, uh, many people are thinking of Ukraine as basically a big farm. And when you, when you ask people what's coming from Ukraine, uh, they would typically say, oh, grain, oh, oh sunflower, oh, yeah, they have the sunflower as a national flower. <laughs> and, and I think it's, it's really, it's, it's about time that we stop thinking about Ukraine in this neo-colonial uh, way, like Ukraine is a big garden, but there's nothing else. Um, Ukraine is, is, I think, a very, very innovative, smart um, um, economy um, that is very fast, very good at improvising. And uh, when we look at the, uh, at the Ukrainian um, IT industry, particularly around Kharkiv. Uh, so it's a very good thing that this counteroffensive uh, was successful. So we have Kharkiv back in the game. Um, then I would say it's, it's a tremendous opportunity for European business to outsource um, IT services that now go into the Czech Republic, into India, and also, of course, into Russia uh, to relocate these um, into uh, Ukraine, because the Russian IT industry is now being actively destroyed by Mr. Putin uh, by way of emigration. So <laughs> unfortunately, the Russian tech workers are now Armenian, Turkish, or Arab, uh, United Arab Emirates uh, tech workers. Um, and of course, they are all sanctioned and no one touches Russian business right now. Um, but it's very different with the Ukrainians. And I'm not only speaking about the Ukrainians now in Ukraine, I'm also speaking about the displaced persons um, because we have in Switzerland this particular regime, this S status, uh, which you see um, in, in, the, uh, in the left upper corner. Um, Ukrainian refugees are eligible to work in Switzerland. They need a permit, but that permit can be issued quite quickly and in an unbureaucratic way, much unlike Germany or Poland. Um, so um, it, it would be a nice business model, particularly for highly qualified people to keep them in Switzerland for a time, employ them here, let them, let them work, let them earn a decent salary, put them in contact with Swiss business. And then when eventually um, these people go back, uh, we have very nice and pre-established business relationships between the Swiss IT industry and the Ukrainian IT industry. And I think that would be, that would be very fruitful. Now, this is, I think, but one example of the service industry um, that, that uh, has, in my view, tremendous uh, opportunity for potential uh, for, for development. So um, I, I'm not saying anything against Ukrainian farmers or Ukrainian crops. Uh, they are great, um, but it's, it's not the only thing uh, that Ukraine is, is capable of. So I think services is, is definitely an area um, that we should look at. And finally, um, this is actually an, an idea um, that, that goes back to my conversation with Elena Parker. Um, I once said that uh, Switzerland and Ukraine have another thing in common. They are, if you will, block-free uh, states. So Switzerland is not a member of the European Union. And uh, because of that, it's quite liberal in its uh, foreign trade uh, policy. So it has, of course, free trade with the European Union, but it's not a member. 
So it is not bound by EU regulation. And the same goes for Ukraine. Maybe in, let's say, five or 10 years, Ukraine will be an EU member, who knows? But for the time being, Ukraine is not bound by EU regulation. And that can be a big plus because it can put you in direct trade relationships with basically the whole world. Uh, and, uh, and you don't have to go through large uh, bureaucratic uh, procedures or voting procedures with other members. Now, we have a free trade agreement between the EFTA uh, countries, which includes Switzerland and Ukraine since 2012. So we have that access. Um, we have um, a large, well, we, ha we don't have complete free trade with, uh, with the, uh, Great Britain, but um, we have largely free trade in terms of goods with Great Britain. And since this week, Great Britain has abolished all import duties and tariffs for uh, goods that come from Ukraine. So you see this, this blue triangle, it's, it's not perfect free trade, but it's very close to it. And then there's a, there's a final thing. Um, the, um, the, the man in the, in the uh, right-hand corner uh, to the right uh, is our Secretary of State, Mr. Cassis. And um, I put him there because Switzerland is the only European nation that has a free trade agreement with China. It has been um, having that since 2014, and it's now being expanded. So even more free trade, even more liberal trade. And uh, when you consider that China is also Ukraine's largest uh, trade partner, uh, both in terms of imports and exports, I think it's about 12% of imports and exports that, that uh, go to or come from China. So you see the idea. Um, you could have basically free trade with China if you uh, could channel your imports or your exports through Switzerland. All you would need is a general importer in Switzerland who would handle the goods. Um, and uh, well, Switzerland would, of course, earn some little nice transit fee uh, for providing the service. Um, but it would provide you with well-established uh, trade channels, of course, with trade finance that is uh, very strong in Switzerland, uh, including commodity trade. And um, of course, with predefined logistics routes, uh, what I was talking about before, the Rotterdam uh, route that would directly take your goods without any risk, without going to the Black Sea directly uh, to China. So you see, that's a, it's, a, it's a lot of potential that's, that's waiting there. Um, it, it just needs some, some creative thinking, I would say, some adaptation of, of existing uh, structures, but this is low risk. It's, it's low hanging fruit, it can be built quickly. I'm almost ashamed that I now have to stop because uh, <laughs> normally I, I need some hours to, to really to, to start talking. Um, but uh, I, I will stop here uh, because I'm, I, oh, I, I'm over my allotted time already. Um, but uh, thank you very much for having me and I stand uh, ready uh, for any questions yes, you may have. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Coop. Actually, it's uh, really very interesting to see that despite such a terrific situation in the country, we see that there are lots of opportunities in order to how to um, shape our economy and uh, how to grow after uh, this uh, this war ends. Before we move to uh, Yelena, I would like to ask a quick question regarding yes. this new route that you mentioned between Lviv and uh, Rzeszov. Uh, how quickly do you think it can be established and how much more expensive it would be in terms of logistics um, uh, to to ship goods, like if to compare, for example, uh, while we were shipping from Odessa with the ships, how much? Uh, what do you think? Okay, um, I'm I'm just uh, I'm just going back to to the slide where I presented this this uh, corridor. Um, let me see where we have it. Um, bum, bum, bum. The Zheshov corridor, right? Yeah. Um, so there is uh, there is developed logistics infrastructure uh, already. So we have a we have a motorway um, that is well developed that connects uh, Lviv and Zheshov. Uh, we have a railway infrastructure that connects both. Um, so the, I would say that the logistics is already there. Um, to me, it's not a question of logistics infrastructure. It's about the question of who handles the business. Um, as of now, um, by way of improvisation, of course, we're still at war. You are basically using Polish business and German railways to transport your goods out of Ukraine into Poland. Um, now that helps as a short term uh, improvisation, but you're not making any money off this. The idea is that to, to make money from this, you have to build the respective infrastructure, not in Poland, um, but close to Lviv. Um, so, um, 
say you would really construct uh, such a terminal um, like the one uh, at the Chinese border, I would say um, put it right behind the Polish border. So you see in the middle, the, the Polish city of Przemysl, put it right behind the border because uh, you have uh, ample uh, resources in terms of land. So land uh, needs to be cheap in order to, um, to develop it. Um, you would create lots of local employment. And of course, you wouldn't have to do it uh, on your own. Um, Poland, of course, is NATO territory. So there can be no forward deployment of United States logistics or armed forces uh, too far from Zeshov. But I think if you talk to the Americans and, and explain that it would be very advantageous to reuse this military logistics for civilian purposes, then I'm sure they would provide aid and financing uh, for, for constructing this. Okay, yes, so thank you so much. We will come back to, uh, to the Q&A session after uh, we will hear some uh, interesting uh, discussions with Yelena. So Yelena, uh, can, you, can you start your presentation? Uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you, that would help as well. Thank you. To be unmuted. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, yeah. perfectly. Perfect. Thank you so much for uh, Professor Koy for your introduction and passing on the word to me. And of course, um, I'd also like to thank uh, the Swiss Embassy to Ukraine and the EBA for inviting me to speak today and present our little NGO, if I may uh, call so, and what we're doing based out of Switzerland here. I am originally from Kharkiv, as you have heard, so there is also an emotional attachment uh, to this whole project. And I work in a technology sector here in Switzerland at SAP. When the war has started on the 24th of February, I was affected based on my family roots, based on the network of friends and uh, business owners and uh, our, our community in Kharkiv and across Ukraine, to be honest. And we wanted to do something. Uh, so immediately we started thinking, how can we help? How can we help the people who are currently inside Ukraine in order to uh, show our support. And with this, Impact Ukraine was born. Um, out of the different initiatives that have been arising and you've seen uh, over the last more than two months, we have been focusing on the business sector because that's where our expertise is, the core team and the volunteers who's working with me on the project and as well myself. The most important part was a conversation that I had with an SME business owner in Ukraine during the first day of the war. And I asked, what are you doing with your employees, because I presume that you will probably have financial challenges paying their salaries. And, and he confirmed that because specifically in the SMEs, they don't rely on huge uh, working capital. Normally they rely on their monthly incomes uh, to provide the salaries. And this is how the idea was born that uh, I wanted to do a small first fundraiser so that we could microfinance Ukraine, as you see in our first stream, in order to help the employees of those SMEs across Ukraine with a minimum Ukrainian salary and keep the companies afloat, keep the employees also connected to their companies and provide some immediate relief. Because from this day onward, it was clear to us, the economy will be affected. It has already dropped by 45% and it's declining further in Ukraine. So the question will come of how we're going to rebuild Ukraine, but the question was always, what can we do now immediately in order to support the businesses whilst the war is ongoing? With that in mind, uh, we have a second initiative, which is about raising awareness. And for that, we're also developing a platform so that we can enable European businesses to source from Ukraine. We have a purchasing power in Europe and we can choose to have either services delivered from different countries across the world. And I will come back to Professor Koyf's example uh, later on in the IT sector, of course, but also um, we can choose where we have certain goods manufactured. So now it's a question of when, therefore there's a timing question when the companies will be ready and also what due to not just the geography of the, of the country, but also the essence of what they may choose to source from Ukraine. And last but not least, a fact alluded to earlier for, for by Professor Koip as well, we have a very special situation in Switzerland with the status S. Hence, 
let's leverage the talent that is currently here in our country from Ukraine. So we have helped already multiple Ukrainians brush up their CVs um, and connect them with potential employers. Alone, my company has opened uh, across Europe 3,000 jobs uh, for Ukrainians in order to capture this talent that we heard earlier. Because our mission is to help rebuild the economy of Ukraine. And we don't need to wait fully until the war is over. There are things which we can do in the short, mid and long term. And I'm here to hopefully just share some thoughts on what can be done. Because a lot of companies, of course, have raised donations towards different humanitarian organizations, um, such as the Red Cross and others. And this is amazing to see. However, there is also a business component. So in the short term, what can be done? I've mentioned the microfinance payroll, what we have initiated and keep raising funds um, and organizations also support us in order to directly pay employees of, uh, of different SMEs in Ukraine that we of course audit in advance. You can continue sourcing services. I was very impressed a few weeks ago by a LinkedIn post where some of those IT people that Professor um, Koip mentioned are in the metros, in the basements, but they have Wi-Fi and they need the distraction, they have the expertise, they want to continue working. Today, this industry of IT services is worth 6.5 billion. It was, I have the data pre-war, supposed to grow by well over 9 billion by 2025. I believe there's a chance even to accelerate this further and help this growth because the expertise is available. And of course, these people can also, brings me, which brings me to the next point, provide the expertise whilst they're here in Switzerland. I call it a fellowship. Um, that's just a term um, I've seen in a couple of companies when people from one department go to a completely different area in order to explore a different perspective. And that can be done as well here in Switzerland where Swiss companies could consider hiring some Ukrainian people to equip them with our knowledge, with the cultural elements, with the business ethics, and then when they go back to Ukraine, use it as a collaboration opportunity. And last but not least, which we're also in discussions already with Swiss organizations who are very engaged in this topic is Ukraine has supply chain issues. They need certain goods in order to manage the current situation, but also to keep the economy afloat. And Swiss companies are extremely established across different industries and can provide that supply chain expertise so that um, equally here we have an exchange in the immediate to provide some impact. Moving to the next one, and again, short term, I want to refer that we've actually started doing that already end of February, beginning of uh, March. So this is uh, in action and happening. The situation is changing every week. And of course, we couldn't predict as nobody else in the world how it will evolve. So some companies today and individuals are looking already at the at the midterm impact and are going into the right conversations on the Ukrainian side in order to lay the ground and be ready to start. One topic is microfinancing working capital because companies had infrastructure destroyed. They will need funds to rebuild that and companies can equally, rather than just a donation, direct these funds in order to help the, on the financial side of getting the economy up and running. Equally sourcing products, maybe not the most critical part for your supply chain right now, but there can be non-critical elements such as chairs, furniture and other, other components where you could choose to purchase from Ukraine, because an order worth 100,000 Swiss francs in Ukraine will create jobs. It will allow a company to pay taxes, which will be then used to finance the rebuilding of Ukraine. Employees will earn a salary, again, drive the economy by not only paying taxes, but consuming and rebuilding their homes and houses since 150,000 of homes today have been destroyed and people need jobs to re rebuild their lives. On the IT side, even further, not just sourcing um, services for an existing company, but establishing new shoring centers, which today we have a lot as well in the East, such as the cities of Prague or um, in Poland and others, or for back office administration. And equally, the industry expertise that we have in Switzerland is very unique. And just sharing this expertise 
can bring a lot of value of how businesses can design their business strategy for the future. And last but not least, and again, I want to emphasize that there are companies today that we have facilitated introductions to um, Ukrainian counterparts who are considering joint ventures, who are looking at how and where and when to open local subsidiaries, but also looking at co-innovation. There's a lot of expertise and a lot of talented people in different sectors in Ukraine uh, where that can be a more strategic component uh, for, a, for, a, for a company, of course, as well, in terms of the, the supply chain. So with this, I hope I was able to just put some thoughts into your mind uh, in terms of what can be done immediately, but also what can we do already to start paving the future for the rebuilding of Ukraine and helping the economy of Ukraine. There's a unique situation as we've heard in terms of the trade relations between Switzerland, Ukraine, and of course, uh, the UK and potentially China, but there is a link there is a connection and I think there's a plenty full of opportunity for us to really make direct impact and contribute to rebuilding of Ukraine. And therefore the country is hungry to become European. Switzerland is of course, an, a brilliant example for the European mindset. So let's help them get there. They want to, and we can make a difference in shaping the journey. If you're interested, get in touch. You have the contact details, the slides will be shared. Follow us on social media, you'll see some of the impact stories and uh, get in touch with me personally as well if you'd like to take the conversation further. I think we're opening up for a Q&A and Julia, I'll pass over back to you. Yes, thank you, Yelena, so much. Certainly Ukraine has this uh, uh, strive, you know, to become European, uh, the part of European Union. And we, we do have these values so already. We want to be in this family and certainly we are going to uh, move uh, towards that direction. Uh, colleagues, I do uh, I do engage you to um, uh, to write your questions. I see that you have uh, uh, that um, Dr. Coop already had some communication regarding the competitiveness of Ukrainian goods uh, uh, if to shift uh, to railway uh, route that you were talking about. Can you comment more on that? How uh, you think whether it will influence? I believe that yes. But how, how, how difficult the influence will be on the competitiveness or on the level of prices that we had before the war and uh, when we are going to have it, when, when this new route will be established. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've just provided uh, some material um, by answering directly in the chat. Um, but, but just to make things clear, um, it, it depends a bit on the type of contract that you're using. Um, now, uh, of course, a, a currency is always a, a two-edged uh, sword. Um, but uh, as, as bad as the war is, uh, there are unintended positive consequences for Ukraine. Um, the Grivnia has depreciated much. Now, of course, that leads to inflation internally, but it also makes your exports incredibly competitive. Um, because we, uh, the, the best thing um, you can have uh, when, you, uh, when you are a net exporter of things is a weak currency. So if, um, if the, uh, the contract is in Grivnia, um, then I would say you are very, very competitive. Um, if it's in euros or in US dollars, um, then you should take a look at the futures market. And um, as long as the war continues or as long as this global insecurity continues, we simply do not have normal food markets or normal energy markets. Prices are exploding at this time on the futures market. And the thing is not so much, um, are you competitive in terms of price? The thing is, do you have anything at all that you can ship by tomorrow or let's say by yesterday? Um, prices have uh, increased by about 260% uh, for wheat alone in the futures market. So um, if you could communi credibly communicate to markets that you have uh, large amounts of grain and you're ready to ship them by tomorrow and that Russia cannot interdict them, then I would say no one cares about uh, price differences of 5 or 10% anymore or about competitiveness. Um, to me, the thing is Ukraine is sitting uh, on a pot of gold uh, and, and is not able to, to get it out of the country. That, that is the central question to me. It's about uh, deliverability, about um, reliable supply, uh, not so much about price. 
Yes, it's it's absolutely amazing to hear that despite all of the situation, your prognosis and your forecasts are pretty positive. You know, and it's uh, it's really uh, really amazing that like for for us, it's only the issue whether we are going to use these opportunities as a country and how quickly we are going to uh, to have this uh, to have this done. Um, so I see that we still do not have any other questions. Uh, Alvaro, would you like to comment and sum up uh, on the presentations that we have from, from the colleagues? Well, thank you very much. I think what, what struck me was the, the optimism uh, that I could see in this uh, presentation. Of course, if you organize this, is not to show pessimism, but still uh, the extent of uh, of uh, optimism struck me and also the uh, way how uh, the two persons who spoke managed to show what us not only theories but concrete proposals of how uh, the future of uh, Ukraine could look like. Um, but I'm not a business operator, uh, unfortunately. So um, I would like to, to hear a question from people who would take the risk. This is the thing about a civil servant. We don't take economic risks. Uh, I would be interested to, to hear some reactions from people who might be interested in operating from the companies in the ways that have been shown by, by the two persons who took the floor and whom I also thank very much. Yes, thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, if you have some comments or like uh, questions, you may still send them to us. You see that uh, both of our experts, they have shared their uh, contacts with you, both social medias and emails. As well, we are going to share their presentations with all of the people that participated in, uh, in this webinar. And we do hope to have, the, to have further communication and further discussions on how we can tighten uh, Ukraine's and EU and in particular Switzerland's um, economies in order to grow together and in order to get uh, Ukraine uh, out of this horrible situation that we have now. Uh, at this point, I would like to thank both uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Coop and Yelena for presenting their thoughts and ideas, and as well as Embassy of Switzerland to Ukraine and Moldova, and in particular, Alvaro for uh, supporting this event. We do hope to continue. Uh, we wish all of you peaceful days and a very nice weekend ahead. So have a great uh, have a great day. Uh, see you soon. Thank you. No, have Thank nice you. Time. See you. Goodbye.